So in this video, I'm going to tell you why psychology is a problem when it comes to coronavirus, COVID-19. Why I'm negative about Back to the story, because I've got a story. So I've got some top tips on right, writing. I you to think critically. It helps people like me. So the flu, COVID-19, coronavirus, this is global, it's pandemic, it's impacting not just millions of us, but billions of us. And psychology is probably gearing up to respond in its usual way that it does. It's readying itself to make its counselling and clinical services available for people to offer psychological treatment to individuals you know, impacted by the pandemic. Now that's the level psychology largely works, at the individual therapeutic level. Now, individual treatment in any form it takes, even medical treatment, can't stop the pandemic. It can only mediate the effects of the pandemic. And to quote George Albee, a psychologist who wrote much about the importance of primary prevention, public health teaches us that no mass disease or disorder has ever been controlled or eliminated through individual treatment. So this is why we're seeing the major focus during the early period of the COVID-19 pandemic being on public health interventions that are intended to prevent the spread of the virus. And you know, those strategies of social isolation and public information on good hygiene practices. These are all designed to prevent people getting the virus. Later, there's the hope that medicine will produce a vaccine that can further prevent people getting the virus. Psychology in the West generally does not have a public health focus. It's focused on treatment and really not focused on prevention much at all, or at least preventionist work makes up a very small proportion of the work of psychology. We're primarily working as clinicians and working to treat people's symptoms in our efforts to help people, in particular, help them cope with and hopefully, hopefully recover from their psychological problems. Now, that's fine, we need treatments, but here's the issue. Because psychology has focused on treating the individual, it sought to justify itself by claiming or aiming to convince us that when someone becomes psychologically unwell, it's because of something to do with their personal disposition rather than their social circumstances. And increasingly, psychology has been trying to convince us that this personal disposition is biological and genetic. Psychology has been arguing this for a long time, and at the same time it's been searching for the evidence to support that argument. They've been looking for the genetic component of what they call mental illness for about 150 years, and they're still looking for it because they haven't yet found it. Now, you might have read about a study here and a study there that claims medicine has found the genetic cause for depression, but you haven't read the follow-up research that shows those claims are unfounded. But that hasn't stopped many psychologists continuing to argue that psychological problems have a biological cause. And this has helped to shift the balance of the public's attention away from thinking about the broader social factors that cause distress and onto the characteristics of individuals that make them prone to becoming psychologically unwell. Outside of psychology, it's been known for at least 120 years that the major factors that cause psychological problems are social factors and mostly socioeconomic factors. So poverty and poor housing and social inequalities, they've been known to be the major contributing factors and that research dates back to the 1900s. What we actually know is that you're more likely to experience anxiety or depression if you live in poverty. And that's kind of obvious, and it's embarrassing even to have to say it, you know? It really is so obvious that it makes me worry about being paid a salary as an academic psychologist to say it. But I have to say it because psychologists often don't say it or they don't say it enough, and some don't say it at all because they're actually arguing the opposite. They are arguing that poverty is not the problem, but people are the problem. That it's something going wrong in people's heads. Now, what's all of this got to do with COVID-19? Well, the problem is that psychology has fixed our attention on the individual as the site of many problems. And that's not a good thing when you're having to deal with a pandemic like COVID-19, because COVID-19 requires us to turn our attention towards the social environment. And psychology is not wholly to blame for keeping our attention on the individual. Other things are to blame here. Really to blame are governments that promote the idea that individ the individual is more important than society. Psychology 
generally feeds that idea, but it's largely coming from government. And when we become unwell or others around us become unwell, it invites us to ask the wrong questions, such as what's wrong with me or what's wrong with you. If we were more focused on the social factors, we'd be asking different questions. So we would ask, are there problems where you live? Or are you okay for money? Or is someone giving you a hard time? We would understand that most people's problems are caused by something happening around them rather than something happening only in their head, only within them. That thinking that it's about the social environment people are in would have helped us to understand right from the very beginning of the pandemic that our health was dependent upon the health of everyone else around us. The penny would have dropped quicker than it did and maybe fewer people would have been put, up, put off going to the beach with their pals. You know, um, maybe more people would have listened to that when the government started telling everyone to practice social isolation. Now let me take you into this issue in another way and look at how this individualistic bias of psychology is reflective of the individualist bias of our governments. Basically governments in Australia, the UK and the US among others are structured around a core ideological belief and that belief is that people are selfish and if you give people the right information they will act on it logically and rationally so as to promote their own self-interests. And if everyone acts in their own self-interests it will be good for everyone because what's good for the individual is good for society. Now governments like those in Australia, the UK and US are starting to understand after this pandemic, during this pandemic, that this thinking is misguided and it's not going to get us out of the COVID-19 pandemic. When the pandemic started to hit those countries, politicians started off giving advice and information about what you could do to protect yourself and asking individuals to exercise their own common sense. Australians should continue to go about their lives in their normal way and just exercise common sense. You know, Australians are common sense people. Uh, they respond with common sense solutions. And the problem with that at, in those early days was that, well, we don't actually individually have that common sense because none of us had the experience of living through a global pandemic of this scale. You know, we have no individual common sense because we have no lived experience to rely on. The only common sense that there is that we have is in our historical records and in our scientific knowledge about what happened in the last major flu pandemic in 1918. So that common sense is not something individuals have, it's a shared resource, in this case a resource contained in our historic history books. And, and we need to be taught about that history. We need to learn more about that history. Now, why did governments in Australia, the UK and the US and elsewhere start off by asking us to exercise our individual common sense when deciding how to respond to COVID-19. Why? Well, really there are kind of three reasons for this. First, it's a sign of how these governments are asking for individuals to carry the responsibility for things that used to be held, that they as governments used to be held responsible for. So you're now responsible for your own education, that's called lifelong learning. You are now responsible for your own health, that's called healthy lifestyles, and you're responsible for your own employment, which is called actively seeking work and other such phrases. And you are asked to be responsible for your own housing, which is called home ownership. That way, government carries minimal liability and risk when things go wrong. It wasn't their fault. They didn't tell you what to do. You did it of your own accord. Second, it signifies an increasingly litigious environment whereby governments don't want to give us direct advice because if that advice is wrong, we might sue them. And that's a big problem if you're given advice to a major corporation because major corporations can sue governments for lots of money. Thirdly, and more broadly, it's a sign that the governments are indeed carrying that notion that we'll all ra act rationally in our own best interests and that we're all, in doing so, that will be for the common good. And the coronavirus has shown the failings of that approach and has pointed to how we do need to act collectively, not individually, and that we do need to understand that our well-being is dependent on the well-being of others 
and that our social context is the major factor that impacts health and that our government has to take responsibility for ensuring that social context is good for everyone and that though if anyone is put at risk in our society that puts us all at risk. Now for now governments are shifting towards that point. How long they'll stay there who knows. How long that will last after the pandemic is over you know who knows. It'll be interesting to see and it'll be interesting to see if psychology is going to shift you know shift away from its focus on the individual. I'd say we can but hope that it will, but time will tell. Anyway, till next time, ta-da.